Good morning. Welcome to Math 261 at Delta College. This is Vector Calculus, Tuesday, October 5. It's our class session. And today we open up chapter four. And this is the topics we're going to discuss today. It's a relatively graphical discussion, so we can show you how to visualize some things nicely in mathematics here. Uh, you're welcome to put any questions in the chat or vocalize any questions you want. First, let me remind you that you have been working on your first exam for the last seven days. And that is due by 11.59 p.m. tonight. That's Tuesday, October 5. As you do with any assignment in our Math 261 assignments folder on our website. But we'll go past our website just to show you where that is. Again, a single PDF file, please. Organized neatly. And with your name, it would be nice if your name was on each paper because when I open up the files, I don't necessarily see your names on the paper while I'm working on them. And sometimes I have to go backwards to the file title. I just want to make sure what happens is I don't put someone else's name on the file accidentally when I'm organizing the files, you know. And that if I see your name on the paper and your name on the file, I feel more comfortable that I didn't miss something. Uh, I am somewhat available today if you want to ask questions. Of course, you can ask questions all day long. Towards 10 or 11 at night, I may not be online. And so last minute questions are kind of dicey, kind of not likely to get answered. So if there's anything you want to clear up or ask now before we get started, as you finish up your exam preparation, please put it in the chat. Well, if I can comment on it or not, I'll tell you. But if there's something weighing on your mind or bugging you, then let's get it out for everyone to observe live or recorded here. Otherwise, you can ask questions throughout the day. And Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm in class a lot. And then afterwards, I have appointments at home. So I check into my email, but I'm not on it all the time. OK. Uh, you can still throw questions in the chat as we go along during the day. Uh, I do, you know, you're doing a good job of explaining on your homework. You're getting better and better at explaining. You're getting better and better at organizing your papers. You know, what does it mean to organize your papers? If you have to ask, is this papers organized? Is these five or six sheets of paper organized? Then it's not organized. Organized is means obviously everything's in the correct order, well labeled, so that someone can read it and follow it. So that's what it means to organize your papers. So you're doing a good job at that. Everybody can always do better. I can always do better. Explanations, you have to give complete explanations and calculations. I had a question earlier that I'm not sure if I shared with the whole group, but it was, you know, can I just show a picture of this and say, well, we see that. We see that X or we see that Y. So how do we see that? You know, you can't just show a picture and say, well, from this picture, it's obvious that blank. Unless it's truly, truly obvious. So when the exam questions say calculate or show, then the burden is on you to calculate or show, not just use phrases like clear or obvious or this picture shows. If this picture shows, then tell me how that picture shows. Okay. So don't take any shortcuts. So what have we done so far? Chapter two, we oriented ourselves to space.
how to measure distance, how to measure angle, how to construct basic figures, points, lines, planes, vectors, projection of one vector onto another, the standard tools of cross product and dot product and box product. Well, the box product was the cooperation of the cross product and the box product. And what do we do in chapter three? Chapter three, we took our tools out for a test drive on some very simple one-dimensional animals, curves in space. Could we do calculus on curves in space? When I call curves in space one-dimensional, you say, well, but they're in space. They're occupying three dimensions of space. But their body and their essence is a piece of wire. It's controlled by one parameter, X or T or S or U. It's described by following that parameter. Let's say it was T. Most often it was T. Following that parameter T forward or backward. So when I only have two directions that my parameter can operate in, like forward or backward, I call that one dimensional because if I straighten that object out, it would just be a number line or a line. But curves in space can be pretty complicated and we were successful at creating a frame of reference for any curve in space that was tied to the curve itself and independent of any other frame of reference. We did the calculus on them. We described how they curved, how they twisted, how they turned. We have a complete description of curves in space. And that's the Frenet frame and the Frenet Saray equations. Later, if you were more interested in other classes, you would investigate the Frenet Saray equations in more depth. You would do that in a future calculus class or in a differential equations class or most notably in a differential geometry class. How can you use calculus to tell you more about geometry? But generally those things are for people who are wanting to be math majors in particular, where you go into the mathematics in more detail. So where should we go now? If we have a feeling for one dimensional animals in space, well, the next step up would be two dimensional animals in space. And what are two dimensional animals in space? Uh, the simplest description is surfaces. And I could draw a casual surface here on our paper. Three dimensions, my X, Y, and Z. I'm gonna tear off this paper in a second so I can move it more effectively. And let's just picture a bubble or a mountain in space. This is like a sheet or a parachute or a bubble or a piece of rubber floating above the XY plane of space. And I could imagine that at every point in the XY plane, let's call this point X comma Y, I've already made this statement casually once, but I use the generic letters X and Y to be a point here in the plane. I always use the, I also use the generic letters X and Y to be the names of the axes, the X axis, the Y axis, the axis that contains the X values, the axis that contains the Y values. If that's annoying or confusing 
for someone to use these letters to stand for numbers and a point here, or large collection of numbers here, then the way to fix that is just to formally name these, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. But most often I just say x, y, z. So if that helps you make the difference between the axes and the points, you go right ahead. And at that point right there, I take an elevator up to the surface of the bubble. And I record how many floors I rode in that elevator. And let's call that value Z. The height above that point that lies on the surface. So for different X's and Y's, I'll get different Z's, right? So I could legitimately say, well, Z may be a function of X and Y. I might be able to find a formula that describes this surface. And that's what we said when we organized our functions several sessions ago. This is a function of several variables. Several is a commitment to not any number, could be a function of two variables, three variables, 10 variables. But when I say this is a function of several variables, I'm saying I have several different independent inputs. If I want to be more formal, I'll call it a real valued function of vector variables. That means vector x and y in, a vector is a list of numbers, and one real value out, like four or seven or minus three. So chapter four is about studying such functions. But we're not going to be prejudiced about any number of inputs or the names of the outputs. See, sometimes when you write f of x, y, z, it has the, like the ring of finality to it. x, y, z, these are the last letters in the alphabet. We're not going to do any more. But there's no reason you can't say the input was three numbers. And the output was another number, which we'll call W. And then someone can't say, well, you got the letters out of order, but this is a vector valued function. I'm sorry, this is a real valued function of a vector variable. And here the vector has three inputs, three independent inputs, one real number output. So this is another function of several variables. It could be that function measures the temperature in the room that you're in. Every point in the room that you're in has an X coordinate, Y coordinate, and Z coordinate, according to some frame of reference. And let's let W record the temperature. But I do not want to be prejudiced about the number of variables at all. So when mathematicians want to say that to you, remember, you can have as many Indian independent inputs as you like. They say it like this f of x1, x2, all the way up to xn. Now these are n independent variables, and I'm not gonna make any commitment to you as to what the n is. The n could be two or four or 10 or 100. And then I could say, pick a letter over here, a nondescript letter, a w, a z, a y, anything you like. But if I pick a nut letter over here, the trouble is if I pick Z, then you're thinking about three space. And obviously I'm not necessarily thinking about three dimensional space. If I pick a Y, you're thinking about the X, Y plane, two space. And I'm not necessarily talking about that. So whatever number I put over here, whatever letter I put over here tends to prejudice people. So sometimes people do pick a nondescript letter such as a W. What would a function look like with three variables of input and one variable of output? Well, like I said, it could be the temperature in the room you're in, but how do you graph temperature? To graph this function with two variables in, one variable out, I need three-dimensional space. To graph this function with three variables in and one variable out, I need four-dimensional space. I cannot draw easily 
in four dimensional space. Now I hedged that, right? I said, I can't draw easily in four dimensional space. We can make drawings such as that. For example, the drawing on the paper in front of you is representing three dimensional space. You and I agree that this is a picture in three dimensional space, but wait a minute, it's written on a piece of paper. So it's not a picture in three dimensional space. It's a picture in two dimensional space. Well, which is it? This is a three dimensional representation. It's a representation of a three dimensional object on a piece of paper. You could say that this is a projection or a shadow of three dimensional space onto this two dimensional piece of paper. So I can draw a three dimensional object on a two dimensional piece of paper. I could also construct a model of a mountain on my desktop in my office. And you know that might be illustrative, but it wouldn't be simple or easy to construct. It would take a certain amount of time. So if I can draw a shadow of a three dimensional object on a piece of paper, could I not draw a shadow of a four dimensional object in space? The projection of the four dimensional object into three dimensional space? Could I not draw a projection of a four dimensional object into two dimensional space on this paper? Well, I could, but that tends to require a little more concentration or skill. So what I'm trying to say is, we have a really nice way of representing a real valued function of two variables. It's a surface. But for a real valued function of three variables, we're gonna to have to come up with another way of thinking about it, representing it. We'll demonstrate that. And for a real valued function of many variables, well, we're gonna to have to weigh our visual intuition very carefully our visual intuition might distract us or trick us. So now we're going to have to use, when we get into many variables, we're going to have to use our calculus knowledge to build our intuition. OK, so now next question. What does it mean? for a surface to be nice. I'll be very careful. I'm using the English word nice and you usually uh, associate that with the behavior of people. Well, now I wanna talk about the behavior of a surface. Remember when we were talking about curves in space, we didn't want to study any crazy bent or broken piece of wire that someone would hand us, right? He said, well, we want the curves that we study in space to be, we had a word for it, smooth. And smooth meant the speed that you record as you travel that path is never zero, or that the velocity is never the zero vector. In other words, there's no places where you stop, abruptly change direction, and then go off at some crazy corner. This would be an example of something that's potentially not smooth. So now, and, and the reason why we restricted ourselves to those curves is because those curves were most amenable to the calculus. I was able to take rates of change. I was able to make predictions about the behavior. If something's flying along in an erratic pattern like this, well, the best I can do is break their erratic pattern up into smooth pieces and say, well, I can tell you everything you want to know about each of these pieces. But the moment that that drone froze in three-dimensional space right there, 
I can't make any prediction about what it's going to do next. But as long as it was flying in some predictable and smooth path, I can tell you where it's going to be in the next millisecond. I can tell you its velocity, its direction, its turning, its rolling as it follows a smooth path. Now, what would be the analogy for surfaces in space? And this is the purpose of sections one and two in chapter four. So what kind of words do we use for niceness? Nice is not a mathematical word. Well, we use these words. It's well-defined. That means we understand the description. Sorry, move my paper up. You use this in calculus. Okay, hang on. My computer is about to go no power. So I figure out what's going on there. Okay, I didn't have the power strip turned on. We use this word limit in calculus to mean that the function is predictable. I'll give you an illustration. We use this word, continuity. And in your calculus one and two experience, continuity was the thing that we attached to the word smooth. To say that something had continuity meant that that function graph was smooth. We used this word. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's. Smooth was reserved reserve for the next word, differentiable. I'm getting ahead of myself. Differentiable was smooth. Continuity, we said casually in English, often as there are no breaks in the function. I'm gonna illustrate each of these. Something is well-defined, that means I understand the function values. Or I could say it like this, there are unique function values. So let's go up the hierarchy with one-dimensional interpretation. So here's a function from your first calculus experience, one over x. This function is well-defined everywhere except at one point. If x is equal to zero, then this function has no output. There's no function value. So we usually represent that then as saying this is a legitimate function so long as x is not zero. But everywhere else, this function is clearly defined. You give me a number, I give you an output. In fact, we can collect all those outputs into a very nice graph. Limit is predictable. If I pick a point out here like two, and I approach two from the left or right, I know what height I'm going to approach. And that height is one half. So to say the limit as x goes to two of f of x equals one half means as I approach 
the point two on the x-axis, I know what I'm approaching on the y-axis. Continuity meant that the number I'm approaching is the actual value of the function at that point. So remember you had a three-pronged test for continuity. Function value exists. The limit as you approach that point exists. And those two things are equal. I've run off the bottom of my paper here. That's a little awkwardly worded or awkwardly placed. So this is the idea of well-defined when I specify a domain. This is the idea of limit. I can predict what happens as I approach any one point in the domain. Uh, I need another color. This is the idea of continuity. Continuity means the prediction I make as I approach that point, the value prediction I make matches the actual value at that point. And the last word was the word that you spent most of your calculus try time trying to understand. So if someone asked you, what is differentiable? Surprisingly, that's not as easy to describe. Now, if you ask a calculus student, is this function differentiable? They're likely to respond, and let me abbreviate diffable for short. That's a kind of a coarse abbreviation, but allow me to use it. Let's ask a calculus student in their first semester of calculus. Is the function f of x equals x squared differentiable? The calculus student says, yes, sure it is, because here's its derivative. You know, they know a rule. You know this rule too. But that's circular reasoning. If I ask you, why is a function differentiable? You can't tell me because it has a derivative. That is that circular reasoning, right? Isn't differentiable to have a derivative? Well, then I'll have to ask you, then what does it mean to have a derivative? So what is differentiable? That's not an easy question to answer formally. And at best in calculus, you left it here. Uh, it has a unique tangent line at that point. That was your idea of smooth, that as you move from point to point on the graph, the tangent line was available and it changed slowly from point to point on that graph. But that's still circular reasoning in and of itself. So in our class, as we finish up chapter four, we're gonna take a harder view of this question. What does it mean to be differentiable? Okay, <clears throat> but all these things were wrapped up in the concept of here is a nice function. Even if it had one bad point, I can deal with that. I'll just throw out the study of that point. I won't study this function at zero. I'd be perfectly happy studying this function at every other point. Now, let me show you some examples of bad. If nice is okay, here's bad. And again, this is not a math word but it's a feeling about the quality of the surface. You could have function 
that's perfectly predictable. Let's take x squared minus four over x minus two. I could easily draw this function. By my algebra techniques, I know that this is equal to x plus two, but only if I don't plug in two. And you say, well, there's nothing wrong with plugging in two. You put in two here, you get four. No, if you put in two to this function, you get four. But if you put it two to this function, you get undefined. It's not defined. It's not well-defined at that point. So if I make the simplification, then legally I have to say, don't use two. Other than that, I understand this function very well. It's a line. Let's call this two. Let's call this slope one. But at x equals two, there's literally nothing there. Now, as I have expressed it here, as long as I exclude two, this function is well-defined. We all understand how to get a number out if I give you a number to put in. Even if I give you a bad number, you understand how to respond to me. The function is not defined to two. So it's well-defined. It has a limit at every point on the x-axis, even at two, as I approach two from either side. And remember you learned what a left-hand limit and a right-hand limit and a two-sided limit was. The limit of this function as I approach two from either side or from both sides at the same time is four. This function is very predictable. As I approach two, the y values, the outputs approach four. As I approach minus one, the outputs approach one. At every point I care to look, this function is very predictable, even at this badly defined place. And notice, I have left side limit, right side limit. From the right, I indicate with a little plus sign. From the left, I indicate with a little minus sign. And looking at two sides at the same time, that's a true two-sided limit. I don't have to put a plus or minus up here. So this function, the summary of my examination here says, yes, there is a limit at two. This function is very predictable. Anywhere I look, I know where this function is going. Well, writing vertically is not very intelligent. I was writing the word predictable here. But I'm gonna pay for that missing value somewhere. Is this function continuous? Well, it's continuous everywhere except two. Because continuous means the value matches the prediction. And if there's no value at two, even though there's a prediction at two, the value can't match the prediction. Everywhere else, the prediction I make as I approach a point matches the value that's at that point. So I can say, yes, I'm gonna look at this in the brightest way I can. Yes, this function is continuous, except at x equals two. How about differentiable? Well, I could find the derivative of this function x plus two. The derivative of this function is one. But I can't say it that way. Legally, I can't say it that way. And I'm trying to sensitize you to this. Is this function differentiable? Yes, because I have a derivative. That's circular reasoning. But let's try the tangent line explanation. Can I draw a tangent line to this function at any point? And the answer is yes, I can. In fact, the tangent line that I draw to this function at any point is x plus two. And there's only one point I cannot draw a tangent line at. And that's the point at x equals two.
there's no point to hang the tangent line on. So I'll also say this function is differentiable, but not at x equals two, everywhere except x equals two. Okay, one more statement now before we go to surfaces and do some images. So you spent a lot of time, whether you acknowledge it or not, thinking about functions at these four levels. Is it defined? Is it well-defined? Can I find a limit at any point? Is it predictable? Defined, predictable, no breaks. Continuity meant there were no breaks or holes in the function. Differential meant the function is smooth or had a tangent line at every point. By the way, I could fix the well-definedness of this, I could simply define the value of this function to be six when x is two. Then that function is defined everywhere. It has a limit everywhere. But notice simply putting the dot there did not correct the break in the function. This function is still not continuous at two. Now I have a limit, now I have a value. I have a prediction and a value, but the prediction as I approach two does not match the value of two. And again, this function is not differentiable. I have a point that I can hang a tangent line on, but what does it mean to be a tangent line through this red dot up here? Uh, there's lots of lines that only cross that point at one dot. Uh, and, and does tangent line mean only crosses the graph or only touches the graph at a single dot? No, certainly not. Because then I couldn't call this a tangent line. This is a tangent line to this graph, but it crosses the graph more than once. So we're gonna have to be a little more careful with what we call tangent, tangent line, and differentiable. Okay, so now let's go to space and let's try to take these words to space. Well defined, predictable, no breaks, and smooth. So let's try a very simple function and let's graph it as well as we can in Mathematica. And this may require some fiddling around. So I wanna show you how to graph some unusual or odd things in Mathematica today. Let's take this function where I say x plus y over x minus y. And let's look at these four qualities. Now it's clearly two independent numbers in and one number out. And the way I calculate that number is by adding these two numbers, subtracting these two numbers in that order, and then dividing. So I could say that I understand the definition of this function, but that doesn't mean it's defined everywhere. Now, for example, if I say three and one, it's very easy to calculate the value of the function, four over two. If I say pi and seven, then the value of that function is pi plus seven over pi minus seven. Whatever numbers you give me, I'll give you an output. Almost. When I give you three and three, then you say six divided by zero, and you immediately say that's not defined, it's not well-defined. You, you say it in, in, in different phrases. Sometimes people taught you to say it's undefined at that point. It's not defined at that point. If we're trying to be formal, we might say it's not well-defined. It's not formally defined at that point. 
we're talking about the word here, domain. Domain are the values I'm allowed to insert into the function. So I realize that this function has a problem if I divide by zero. Well, where do I divide by zero? If x minus y is not allowed to be zero, then I know what problem, what points I'm not allowed to use. I'm not allowed to use any point where x and y are the same. So I could fix the definition problem of this function by rather saying f of x, y is x plus y over x minus y, so long as x is not equal to y. This function is different than this function. Domain is important. I could say, let's only do this function where y is strictly bigger than x. I could, main, I could name many legal domains for this function. But unless I'm told otherwise, I usually choose the domain to be the largest set on which the function is defined. So a function is not legitimately defined until you specified its domain. Well, now let's see if we can't draw this. Okay, so now uh, our vision to draw this. Let me pull up Mathematica. Let me share this with you. And I might share the whole screen with you presently, not right now, because I'm thinking, you know, if I pull up the documentation, we sometimes need the whole screen so you can see the documentation. Let me just share the window. And let me just make a crude attempt to graph that function. So I'm gonna set this up in Mathematica like this. I'm gonna load this up so you can see it a little bit easier. I'm going to say, uh, we'll just call this a surface in space. And I'll define the function f of x underscore comma y underscore bracket colon equals x plus y divided by x minus y. I need parentheses around the x plus y and the x minus y so that it's presented the way I want it to be presented. Now notice about the syntax right here. Let's go from left to right. Function, you can define functions to be any name in Mathematic you want. Internal functions always are capitalized at the beginning and they might have their own camel case capitalization along the way. By camel case, I mean, if someone says parametric plot 3D, that's you know capitals interspersed along the way, that's called camel case. That's not important for us to study right now. Uh, notice when I'm defining a function, I have to say x underscore y underscore, because I have to say to Mathematica, I'm reserving these letters to be variables. So this, I, I gave a formal discussion of what this is in another Mathematica sample sheet. But these letters, x and y, are reserved to be variables. Colon equals is a formal way to define a function It says, Whenever you see f of x, y in the future, you're going to replace it with this expression. You're going to evaluate this expression. So if I ask Mathematica what f of 3 comma 1 is, and I have to use square brackets when I define function Mathematica. Oops, I didn't get anything back. Why didn't I get anything back? Let's study this. Because I never executed this line. Do you see how the f is blue when Mathematica shows you a phrase, a variable, an object in blue, Mathematica is saying, I don't know what that is yet. So I didn't hit shift return on that line. Now it turns black. Now f of three, one is two. f of pi and seven is pi plus seven, pi minus seven, although Mathematica writes it in an odd fashion. f of three, three. 
Mathematic gives me an error. Uh, now we're going to say is six over zero infinity, infinite expression encountered. Mathematic is just warning you that you're dividing by zero. So it's not defined. In future mathematics classes, you might discuss how you could make that represent some value or entity. Okay, so I'm going to remove this though. Let's just try a simple plot, plot 3D. And the nice thing about defining the function above is now I just refer to the function by the name I used. And I tell Mathematica where I wanted to plot it. Let's say for X is from minus one to one or minus two to two. And for Y is from minus two to two. Let's see what we get. Well, again, I get this warning that something bad happened. It encountered division by zero. But other than that, I get some kind of surface. Now, Mathematica has made a perfectly predictable and smooth surface in some places. In some places, it's got this little gray region here, like a little wing attached to the surface. Is that part of the surface? The answer is no. What Mathematica is telling you is it has more values to this surface above the box or below the box, outside of the box. So it trimmed the surface that way and said, there are more values that I have here, but they're outside this box. And then there's just a whole knife that went through this surface, a whole cut that went through the surface. And I can look at it very carefully there, if I tilt that box, it looks like I sliced the surface with a knife. And, and I did in a way, the knife was called y equals x. This line, if I look at it from above, it's kind of torturous to move this box around, sorry. <laughs> I'm really making a mess of that. hard to view this from above. That line right there is the line y equals x. So how could I draw this so that I have more of this surface? I can visualize what's happening. What's happening at the origin? I don't know. There's a violent tear in that surface right there. Well, first thing you say to yourself is, well, Dave, you just didn't use enough y's and x's. Okay, so let's pump it up to Minus four to four. Well, I made the box bigger because you can see the box now goes from minus four to four X and Y, but I didn't change the quality of the surface. The surface looks about the same, right? So scaling is not the issue. In fact, mathematics says, oh, no, there's still more, it's teasing you. No, there's still more above this box. There's still more below this box. And then the other thing that bugs me right here is, am I always going to get this error message like u divided by zero, u divided by zero? Let's try to approach this another way. I'll go back to my paper for a second. And I'll look at the domain of this function. The domain of this function in the xy plane. I can take any point I please in the xy plane and stick it into that function. Now, I'm not doing a three-dimensional drawing, I'm doing two-dimensional drawing, but there's one line that I can't use. And that's line y equals x. Sorry, I'll move my paper up. So maybe to stop Mathematica from throwing that error at me, maybe what I should do is tell Mathematica to graph that surface, but don't touch that line. Now, there are multiple ways I could do that, but let's think about that. 
what if I asked Mathematica to draw the surface, but don't touch that line? It's a little bit like telling Mathematica, I want you to use lines to draw that surface, but not that line, k equals one. Let's try the line y equals two x. Put the line y equals two x into this function expression, x comma two x. What do you get? On top, you get x plus two x, which is three x. On the bottom, you get x minus two x, which is minus x. Well, that's very interesting. When you plug in the line y equals two x, do you see that the function's value is minus three? Doesn't even matter what x is, the function's value is minus three. Let me see if I can make a note of this in my drawing. So here's the line y equals two x. And everywhere on this line, f equals three. Let me try another line. Let me try the line y equals minus x. Minus x is okay, it's just one x bad. Minus x, not bad. Let's try to plug in the line x minus x. Well, you see on top, when I plug in x minus x, I add them together, I get zero on the bottom. X subtract minus x is two x's. Result zero. Notice on this line, the function is constant. So I'm gonna draw another line y equals x, negative, and then say to you on this line, f is always zero. Now these lines that I'm drawing right here are curves in the plane where the function is constant. They're called level curves. Curves where the function is level. Now since I can't afford to do this for the next hour, one line at a time, why don't we go for the whole banana? Let's plug in every line except k equals one. So now let's plug in y equals kx, f of x comma kx. And what do I get when I do that? I get x plus kx, x minus kx. You notice that you can factor the x's out of the top. Excuse me, I slid off the edge of the paper out of the top and out of the bottom. And again, the x's cancel and I get y plus k over y minus k. Now you say, well, that's not a constant anymore. No, it is a constant. For every k that you pick, you get a different height. Every k produces a different height. Every k produces a different z. Now we might have a feeling for what this thing could possibly look like. Let's go back to Mathematica and let's show you. Now I could draw lines in here, lots and lots of lines until I litter the paper. Let's use k equals one half there. What's the value of the function of k equals one half? Well, if k equals one half, I get one plus one half, one minus one half, three halves over one half. That's three positive. This was three negative. I don't think my negative sign showed up very well there. If I picked one tenth for the slope, I would get one plus one tenth, that's 11 tenths, one minus one tenth, that's nine tenths, I get 11 over nine. I mean, every time I pick a different K, I'll get a different function value. Let's see if we can represent that in Mathematica, and then we're gonna have to take a break before we go for the ultimate picture. So I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen in that window. And I want to make a nicer picture that doesn't have these disruptions. So how do I plot these level curves? How do I visualize the level curves on the surface? 
In mathematical, it's called contour plot. We've used contour plots 3D to do surfaces, but I just want to see contour plot. I want to picture the domain like I drew on my paper. So let's say contour plot f of x comma y. And let's do the same, you know, x equals minus 2 to 2, y equals minus 2 to 2. Let's just see what we get out of this. Okay, I'm, Mathematica says, notice how contour plot is now blue and Mathematica just parroted it back to me. Again, that's Mathematica's way of saying, I don't know what you're talking about, Dave. And then I realized I did the contour plot instead of the contour plot. I misspelled contour. Let's try again. Now it's black, do you see that? It's not blue anymore, it's black. With that U in there, it was blue. And Mathematica tried to help me like, do you mean one of these? Because it didn't recognize what I was trying to type. So let's get rid of the U. Now Mathematica reads it. Now let's execute it. I still get that warning, but look at this. I get different lines. Now look at Mathematica. Every time I touch a line, it tells me how high the function is on that line six, four, here's the height two, here's the height zero, y equals minus x. So Mathematica is avoiding this y equals x, but it's giving me different heights at different points. Now, I could ask for a specific contour by saying, giving it a specific number. Tell me where it's three. And then Mathematica gives me this line, which happens to be the line of slope one half. You can tell by the points that it goes through. Or I could give Mathematica possibly two different points. Show me where it's three or minus three. Oh, oh three or minus three, excuse me. Mathematica shows me these two lines, slope two and slope one half. I could take this out entirely. If I don't specify a value, Mathematica says, well, I'll show you some different heights. I'll show you some different values for X and Y. And it color codes them by the height. And it looks like blue means higher, and then lighter numbers mean lower. Let's see if I can add contours. A number of contours to this, like 10 contours. Uh, no, that doesn't see. Oh, I did contours again. Excuse me. If I do 10 contours, uh, option expected. Okay, so I put that in the wrong place. I think we have to take a break now, but I just want to see if this executes. Now it drew 10 contour lines. Let me draw 100 contour lines. I think I'm going to regret this. To draw 100 contour lines took a lot of energy out of Mathematica, but it's pretty. And by the way, it shows me the values on each contour line. So this is giving me a more of an idea. See how the numbers grow in this direction and decline in this direction. I guess darker meant lower. I misspoke that earlier. Okay, how could I take this idea of graphing on lines and make it improve this picture? That's what we're gonna do next. Let's take a break. Let's say we come back at 9.07. And 907 is fair. And then we'll see if we can improve the view of this surface by drawing it on different lines. I'm going to mute my microphone while I stretch my legs. You can do the same. I'll see you in a few minutes.
Okay, we're back. Uh, I just want to take you to a quick space on our website. You you know where to hand in your exam and stuff like that, but just make sure everybody's on the same page. This is our week six page. And remember, exam one is due 1159, Tuesday, October 5, in the Math 261 assignments folder. Uh, this week, I'm going to fill in some more homework problems for the weekend for you. But I'm going to have you explore, first of all, in 4.1, just a, a simple problem. We're going to get back to homework now. So your homework vacation is over when you hand in the exam. So in section 4.1, I want you to do an example where you're talking about level curves. We're using this idea of level curves or level surfaces. We'll introduce level surfaces in a second. And then 4.2 and 4.3, we're going to do some problems with continuity over the weekend, some more intense description of services after I'm getting collecting your papers and letting you work on this. So I'm gonna fill in some problems here for you over the weekend in the next day or two. Okay, let's go back to our surface. So the idea is maybe the key to this surface is just avoiding the bad line. And the bad line is y equals x. So let's go back to Mathematica and see if I could draw a picture of that surface by avoiding the bad line. And I'm going to do that with parametric plot. So let's go share the screen. So I, I have a feeling for what the surface looks like. You know, I guess I could improve this slightly by saying, uh, Plot range, let's say plot range is uh, looks like minus four to four, minus four to four, minus four to four. What I say by improvement, maybe I could get a better view of the perspective if I was more careful with the units I was using, right? So you can sometimes improve graph like this and then saying that the box ratios, or excuse me, the aspect ratio, that's right. The aspect ratio here is one to one to one. So everything is equal sized. Oops, I'm missing some parentheses. I'm missing a parentheses right there. Uh, what did I screw up? I'm missing a comma right there. Okay, did it do the aspect ratio of one to one to one? It didn't seem, am I using aspect ratio incorrectly? Okay, that's, you know, that's a little more. Now I see that this thing has a kind of a gentle and consistent curve to it, a gentle and consistent twist to it. Maybe that's part of this, but I still am a little bit dissatisfied with that break region. Okay, let's go down here and try to graph only on lines, parametric plot 3D, and we'll do it like this. We'll use, sorry, I got to use square brackets around a function. We'll graph this list, x comma y comma f of x comma y. Now, I still haven't filled this in, but I'll, specify the x and y and position f of x, y directly. And I'll replace the y with k times x. So this is how I plot by plugging in functions. Now notice my variables here are no longer x and y. They're x and new variables called k. So let's run x from, you know, minus two to two again, right there. I have to say x comma minus two to two. Let's run k from what to what? Well, I'm trying to avoid k equals one, right? So let's run k from, oh, 1.1 1 .1 to four. Let's just see what happens if I try this. Let's use some indenting 
to make this easier to read. Okay, that's interesting. I don't get that crazy angry break from Mathematica. And what I get if I view this from above is hard to see this, but I get different lines making up this surface right here, way, way down. Now, I think I want to get the perspective right. So I'm gonna go up here and borrow the plot range and aspect ratio that I did up here that made that surface a little bit better. Let's try to borrow it here with the comma proceeding. And let's insert it right here. Okay, now I seem to have less of the surface, but I get the idea maybe I could fill in more. So how could I do this? I could fill in more, I could make a 10 here. Oh, that filled in a little bit higher, didn't it? I could try 20. That filled in a little bit more. And remember, a uh, K of 20 is a very, very steep line. Very, very steep line on my paper. Let's go to 40. Uh, now I'm starting to get some noise in the graph right here. I think I want to avoid that. I'll show you how to avoid that. What is happening is I'm asking Mathematica to plot lots of things, but not giving Mathematica enough points to plot it. Let's go back to 20. And let's say how I could, remember I'm only graphing things of positive slope right now. Let's add some things with negative slope. Copy, paste. I'll just put a negative in front of that. Keep the same K values, put a negative. But now I'm asking Mathematica to plot two different things. So I need a list of things. So be really careful right here. What I have right here is a list of two parametric things for Mathematica to plot. Let's see how that rolls. Okay, I'm getting more of this twist action. And Mathematica separates the two things I do by plotting the part in yellow and the, or the part in gold and the part in blue. Let me see, let me cut that down to 10 right there, good. And let me see what else I could do. What about Ks between? You know, what about Ks from, right now I've got Ks from 1.1 to 10 and minus 10 to 1.1. What about the Ks in between minus 1.1 and 1.1? What about the Ks that are smaller? like zero to one and so forth. How am I gonna do that? Well, I could mess with this by inverting Ks. If I take Ks from 1.1 to 10 and I invert the K, what do I get? Ks from 1 tenth to one over 1.1, which is 10 over 11. So I think this is a little bit snazzy, but why don't I Place two more things in here where I do one over K. What I'm trying to do is get the Ks from minus 1.1 to 1.1 filled in here. Let's see what that happens. Oh, now I'm getting something. I'm getting something like a twist. Notice consistently there's a hole in here at zero, zero. So now uh, let's look at this from above. You see I'm only graphing it minus two to two, stuff like that. Let me, I'm not filling in this box. Let me shorten up this box a bit. Two to two minus two to two. I don't know if that's going to. Give me something. Ah, now something is definitely suggesting itself. So now I'm going to go back and try to fill in these missing spaces. Let's let this be pumped up to 20. That fills in more of this surface. Let's let this be pumped up to 100. 
That's probably a little too crazy. It's filling in more of the surface. Let's go in here and put in a zero one, one one hundredth. I'm trying to fill in even more of the surface. I'm not working at it. Let's say points. I have to give Mathematica more points to work with. So I have to give Mathematica command plot points. Plot points 10 will tell Mathematica just to use a sample of 10 points. That's kind of crude. See all kinds of breaking up in here. Plot points 50. Mathematica will make a sample of 50 points left and right. Okay, that's not bad. I'm not getting this in the window, excuse me. Let's say that I tried to plot points maybe 100. I don't know how much I'm going to get away with. That was Mathematica's thinking. This black bar on the side means Mathematica's thinking. 100 points from left to right in all dimensions. That's kind of computationally intensive. I'm really not getting the expression I want here. Let me put in from 100 to, yeah, let's try that. Thinking for a long time, I'm asking it to compute numbers that are really close to one. Let's try to look at it from above. You know, I'm not getting the full effect that I want to get because I want to see things filled in right here and I'm not seeing the things filled in right there that I want. So I'm not quite sure why it's not filling that in for me. But I think I have some insight into what the surface looks like. We try one more shot at this. It's kind of zooming out there. And then let me do one more thing. Let's color the surface all one color because this is kind of distracting. Do you see I have four things right here? Let's do this plot style. And let's make this blue with an opacity of 0 0.3. So let's get some transparency going on in there. And I am not sure the problem is right here. If I just say this once, does Mathematica do them all blue? Or do I have to specify four blues? No, it's made one of them blue and the rest of them otherwise. Okay, so let's try it again and let's give instructions for all four surfaces. Let's give the same instructions for all four surfaces, although this looks kind of awkward. Blue, blue, blue. So I'll let you examine that a little bit like that. Now let's try it. Well, what's happening here is that I'm asking Mathematica to work so extremely, but this is a little bit better, isn't it? What I'm doing is giving instructions for how to draw this surface based on the lines that make up this surface. And if I could take a step over to my real world here. I'll show you what the surface actually is. And I'm going to need a piece of paper to do that. So let me take a piece of paper and let me tear this off very carefully. And then I'll step in front of my camera to show you what I'm seeing. Stepping in front of the camera means I should record the camera. So let's do this. Let me tear off this paper very neatly for you. And I'm only going to represent part of the surface with the visual that I'm about to do for you. And I tore the paper in an awkward way. So that doesn't help. But this might be good enough to show it to you. So I'm going to quit this. I'm going to go to my whiteboard. 
And I'm going to pin the whiteboard. And I'm going to take off this pin. And hopefully that means I'm recording correctly. And I don't get to see myself easily. But I think you could describe what the surface is. Visualize a strip of paper. I just took and tore off a strip of paper. And then visualize me twisting that strip of paper. So that I make this edge of the paper and this is the edge of the paper almost line up. What we're drawing right there, maybe I got to step aside so you see the background, is a strip of paper that's been twisted. It's like a strip of webbing used in mountain climbing that's being twisted over on itself. And if I make my top and bottom hands line up at the same point x equals y, almost the same line, that's where this function is not defined. But what I'm showing you is a strip of paper with a twist in it. Now what happens is this strip of paper is infinitely long on the left and right. So that's not everything that's happening here, but it's close to what's happening here. Let's see if we can visualize it in one more way. Let's go back to the paper and record the paper. Let me see if there's another way that I could visualize this. Let's go back to Mathematica. So that's what I want you to see. I want you to see a strip of paper that's been twisted. But the problem is I'm missing this x equals zero, zero down the spine. And I'm not quite hammering this place where these things could meet here either. So that twist is not completely satisfying in the graphical representation. Let's think about this another way. Could I represent this with a different coordinate system? How about f of x comma y? Move my paper down, three sheets of, let's make this x plus y over x minus y. Could I represent this? with polar coordinate input. You know, let's try instead of thinking X and Y, let's think of R and theta. Let's think of X equals R cos theta and Y equals R sine theta. And I'm going to let R run from zero to two. And I'm going to let theta run from what? Well, I, the theta I have to avoid is the theta equals 45 degrees or the theta equals pi over four. So if I could run this everywhere else, but pi over four. So let's say zero to two pi, but let's exclude pi over four. And let's see how this runs. Now, the reason I like this better than the K idea is the K had to be going into massive Ks, right? To get super steep lines or super flat lines. That's very small K, very large K. And then the computer choked with the excess calculations. Let's try this in parametric plot. So back to share screen, back to Mathematica. Let's take what I would do right here. Let's copy it to save time. And then let's trim it down to just use what? R cos theta and R sine theta for X. Now remember, cosine capitalized in square brackets and times, you need that times in there. If you just say Arcos, then Mathematica doesn't know that you're multiplying two things. It thinks you're naming a new thing called Arcos. Separate by a 
space that Mathematica understands implied multiplication, asterisk is very safe. Let's let this be R times sine theta. And now let's let this be F of R cosine theta, R sine theta. Let's just fill those in there. So now I'm gonna use circles and different tilted angles to draw this. So I'm gonna let R run from zero to two. Ah, but R equals zero is the origin, right? So this way I could avoid the origin by saying 0 0.1 to two. And let's the theta run from, now I gotta do this thing, this crazy, crazy thing about avoiding pi over four. So let's say I could do zero to pi over four. Let's try zero to pi over four just as a beginning. And I will modify it in a second. I don't think I need this massive plot points. I'll keep the same range. I won't worry about the style yet. I'll try it out. Okay, so here's that piece of tape being twisted. Let's see if I run it from pi over four to two pi. Let's see how much tape I see. Oh, there's the tape being twisted. Let's see if I can bring those two together. Now, how could I just avoid, let's just see what happens if I said zero to two pi and cause the computer to choke on the pi over four. It's not too bad. Now I feel much better in several ways. Do you see the lines there? Let me cut this box down to minus two to two. So what I'm saying is kind of a simple surface we're looking at, but I have to work to see it. I have to work to see it in space. Uh, let's go to two there, got it. Okay, now I see much more of this thing that I try to describe to you, a sheet of paper or climbing web. I forget the right word for climbing web. When you're climbing, you have special climbing ropes, but you also have straps that are useful for tying certain knots. So this looks like a piece of climbing web that's been twisted. Now I can see that much better. If I wanna go closer to the origin, I could just do a zero one there. Do you see Mathematica is not choking and giving me irregular point values right there? Do you see, let's try here, uh, mesh equals none. There, I just have the thing with no lines on it whatsoever. So there's that twisty rope. Let's run this up to minus four to four, see if I get a different perspective. Yes, from above, I see more of me coming into this line y equals x. I see me twisting a kink in this web. Okay, let's take stock of what we did. Wow. <laughs> That was a serious amount of pain. And I just made up a function. Well, I didn't make it up, of course. I've seen this function before. It's a good example. But to visualize what this looked like took serious work. And this is the problem with functions in general. Most functions are well-defined. Most functions have limit, they're continuous, they're differentiable, but if you introduce a problem, then you introduce a strange behavior in the function. Let me show you what I mean by most functions are nice. If I just went back to my mathematical worksheet, now let's go back to the very top and let's change this function to x squared plus y minus two divided by, well, I'll just leave it like that for a second. Graph that function. This is just some nice little trough or bowl. I don't like this gray cutoff stuff right here. 
I could get rid of this in some fashion, but I'm not going to work on it right now. Let's divide by x squared plus y squared. And look at that. Oh, that's interesting. Kind of like a gravity well. And I noticed that x squared plus y squared could be zero. I could be in trouble. And that's where this surface is taking a nosedive right here. But other than that, look at this is like kind of gradually undulating the surface elsewise. Let's say, let's replace this with a sine of x squared. Now I introduce some serious wiggles into that. Let's get rid of all this extra heights that I don't think I need. Oh, that's an interesting surface. I'm going to try to make my picture larger. Oh, make sure everybody's in space right here. Good. Okay, so uh, let me introduce uh, cosine over here. Capital S cosine. Capital C cosine, excuse me. And let me draw this. Well, now I get undulations in two directions. Notice the, the surface starts to get kind of warped, not by the undulations I'm saying here, but, excuse me, warped by the shadows are kind of irregular in the troughs here. And that's because so much action is going on that Mathematica does not have enough points to plot. Let me add. So if you get irregular shapes in the shadows and stuff like that, add some plot points. Let's make it uh, not plot plots, plot points. Let's give me 30 plot points left, in, you know, side to side. Uh, I forgot a comma. Yeah, now this is somewhat smoother. And if I add 100 plot points, very smooth, but it takes a few seconds for Mathematica to generate. How could I get rid of that hole? Now, remember, I'm dividing by zero if x squared plus y squared equals zero, which is the origin, x equals y. But let's add a simple one right here. What does the one do? Since x squared plus y squared is never negative, the lowest it could be is what? Zero? This one elevates the denominator and clears it away from zero. Let's see what we got now. Oh, now I just have a nice wiggly surface with a low point. That's pleasant. But what do I want to tell you about the surface? You say, wow, this is a crazy surface. Like, how could I ever visualize it? Well, Mathematica does a really good job of visualizing it if what? If there are no problems in the definition. This function is well-defined everywhere. In fact, I could now decorate this in many ways. I could have it colored by height. Uh, you could look this up. I could have it colored by different color functions. Look up color functions in the look up color functions in the documentation. So what did you remember from your calculus class? You remembered that many, many functions are continuous, differentiable, well-defined, and have limits. Let's go back to our paper here. You learned that if you took two functions that were continuous and added them together, the sum is continuous, the difference is continuous, the product of two continuous functions is continuous. The only time you really got in trouble was when you took the quotient of two continuous functions. The quotient of two continuous functions is continuous so long as the bottom function never takes the value zero. 
Well, now I can do the same thing for functions of two or more variables. If I add functions of two or more variables or subtract them, and they are all continuous, smooth, well-defined, have limits, then so will their sum, so will their product, so will their quotient, as long as what? The bottom is never equal to zero. So what I did to remove the problem in this picture is took out the place where the denominator was undefined with this one plus. I think 100 points is a little bit extreme, but Mathematica is managing it. So even if I give a crazy definition like this, sines and cosines are continuous. Look at the function x squared inside the sine, the function y minus two inside the cosine. Did you learn something about that in calculus? Yes, you learned that if you composed continuous functions, they would remain continuous with a caveat. What you needed was the function g to be continuous at the point x and the function f to be continuous at the point g of x. So you did state this very carefully, but in the end you said a composition of continuous functions is continuous. A composition of differentiable functions is differentiable. A constitute, uh, a, if, if the two functions have limits, composition of functions that are predictable at a point remains predictable at the point under certain conditions of the composition. So what you learned, composition of continuous functions is continuous. And this is generally, you had to satisfy a specific condition. So when do things go bad? When do things be not nice? Things are not nice. Well, think about it. There's actually very few things you're not allowed to do to a number, right? Not allowed to divide by zero. Uh, not allowed to take the square root of a negative number. So we gotta be careful with square roots and negative numbers if we want real valued functions, which is all we're doing in this class. Now, you know, we could talk about complex numbers, but we're not doing complex calculus in this class. Uh, you were told that you cannot take the logarithm of a number unless it's positive. So if this is negative or zero, you can't take the logarithm. What I'm trying to say to you is really, there are very few things you're not allowed to do with numbers. Maybe you could come up with some more for me. You know, you can't take the tangent of pi over two. There are some very, and, and, but that was because why? Because you have the sine of pi over two divided by the cosine of pi over two, and the cosine of pi over two is zero. So if you think about it, there's really very few things that you're not allowed to do with numbers. And you usually understand domains by telling people what they can't use instead of what they can use. Okay, let's expand this. Functions of several variables. How about let's expand this to level surfaces. I made some progress with level curves. What's a level surface? Let's say that I have this function, f of x comma y comma z equals uh, 3x squared plus 4x plus 4y squared plus z squared. Uh, it's clear that this is well-defined. Every time you put three numbers in, you know what number you're going to get out. I never have any danger of dividing by zero. I'm not taking any square roots. I'm not using any logarithms. 
This function is a function that's defined in all of space. But its output is a fourth number. So I need four dimensions if I wanted to see the graph. And that I can't physically take you to. I can't take you to four dimensional space and build a model. But instead of the four dimensional space, what about projecting back to three dimensional space? What about creating a shadow? What about creating different level surfaces? So in three dimensional space, here will be the last graphic I show you today. In three dimensional space, I could examine level surfaces. What happens if I choose different Ks and ask Mathematica to show me the animals that result as I choose different Ks? Well, you've already done that with the contour plot 3D command. Let's go back to Mathematica. Let's zoom back down here. Let's create some, myself some more space. Let's say uh, f of x underscore comma y underscore comma z underscore. Let's define a new function. Uh, I don't want to name collision with the f above, but I'd be redefining it. Let's call it g for safety. Colon equals, and let's say 3x raised to the 2 plus three plus uh, 4y raised to the 2. Notice between the number and the letter, mathematically automatic, mathematical automatically puts a space plus z raised to the two. That's the implied mathematica, implied uh, multiplication. Now let's say contour plot, but contour plot 3D. Notice, by the way, that when I said this, mathematica gave me maybe the most relevant thing on the top contour plot 3D. Let's plot g of x comma y comma z equals four. I don't know where this is gonna happen. So I'm gonna take a generous chunk of space right here, x comma uh, minus four to four. And then I'll copy and paste to do y and z the same. And then I got to end my command with a square bracket. Okay, I got a little egg. Egg. I got an ellipsoid, and this is the same ellipsoid you would have got if you would have typed that formula in just like that. And we did that when we were plotting some general surfaces. This is just a single surface, right? What if I change that to a minus sign? Oh, this is a hyperboloid of one sheet. Now it's not oriented in a simple or obvious fashion, but it's a hyperboloid of one sheet. Make that a little bit smaller. Let me put in another minus sign. Oh, it's a hyperboloid of two sheets. Let me remove the four. What's Mathematica gonna do right here? Mathematica knows that I fed it a function of three variables. It knows that I want contours. It knows that I want level surfaces. These things are called the level surfaces. The collection of all points in space where this function equals four. But since I'm not specifying the four right now, what Mathematica is gonna try to do is gonna try to serve me by giving me a selection of surfaces. That's what I'm expecting. Yes. What Mathematica did is gave me many surfaces for different values of the K. 
Now let's go back to the temperature analogy. Perhaps this function, and it's a crazy function. I have no idea if it's a really realistic function. Maybe this represents the temperature in the room that I'm in at this moment. And as I have different positions, I have sheets in this room where the temperature stays constant. Maybe on the brown sheet, the temperature is 10, the blue sheet, the temperature is zero, and the green sheet, the temperature is minus 10, whatever scale I'm using. Let's put back a plus sign in one of these places, see what happens. It's giving me different surfaces here. Let's mess with this number right here. Uh, let's do one fourth. Well, that makes it less exciting. Let's do 10. Oh, that makes it more exciting. A little sandwich going on right here. Let's do five. What Mathematica is doing is giving me different surfaces for different values of K that satisfy this object. Let's go straight sphere land here. Yes, Mathematica is showing me different spheres. Now, some of these spheres reach outside the box and so they get clipped. Let me ask for more contours. So contours, notice that that's a choice. Let's say I want 10 spheres. I wanna see 10 of these. Well, then it's very, very busy right there, right? And maybe there's some things inside the green ball, but I cannot see because I don't have transparency. I think 10 is making me ill. Let's go to five. So these are level surfaces. Let's go crazy, like let's subtract an X and add the sign of Y squared. See, Mathematica can try to find all the points that satisfy different values of this. And let's call this uh, equals two. Can Mathematica find this surface? It's thinking. Oh, that's a strange looking thing. Some kind of hollowed out gasket or turning, like if you're woodworking. I didn't expect that. Now that's when I have a two there. What if I remove the two and say Mathematicus, show me many different constants for this surface. Oh, and by the way, I'm gonna do the opacity. Let's get some transparency in here so I can see what's going on. Uh, plot contour style, excuse me, not contour style. I don't know why I can't spell contour. Contour style opacity. See, Mathematica says to me, you need opacity, David. Let's do opacity to Okay, now let's, I think four would be nicer. Let's do an unlimited number of these. Let's do five surfaces with this function with an opacity of four. The Mathematica is gonna naturally color them differently so I can try to see them. That doesn't mean I'm gonna see them well. Notice Mathematica is thinking about this. This is asking for expensive work here. And, and it's gonna be even expensive to rotate it. It's gonna rotate slowly because there's too much data here. But it seems like I've got some corrugated pipes. Maybe that's how I could understand it. These are called level surfaces. Each one of those is a different value of this function. Now, I think I got the circular symmetry because of the uh, X's and Y's. So if I took out the Y action right there, and maybe pumped up the Z action. So you can get totally crazy and you can sync Mathematica, so be careful, but I'm just curious. I'm just trying to get you to understand that there's a lot of surfaces in space. Oh, that's pretty. It seems like some things are happening in the middle and then flatness elsewhere. Maybe I could specify the contours, like 
let's say contours from uh, minus one, minus 0 0.8, minus 0 0.6, minus 0 0.4. I'm not sure what's gonna happen here, but let's give it a shot. I think I'm trying to fill in this empty in-between space. You can be rewarded with some beautiful images. Ooh, now Mathematica is kind of having double vision here. No, it's these surfaces are so close together. That gives me an idea. Maybe I just need to go minus four minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four. I don't think I have all my commas in place, do I? Let's try it out. Where did those bumps come from? What I'm trying to do is open your mind to the idea that surfaces can have a great variety and beauty and I want to study surfaces in space the same way I studied curves in the plane. Okay, what I've got here is a very nice thing, but I think a little too dense and so expensive, very expensive for Mathematica to rotate. But I see a flatness right here. Let's take out some of these. Trouble is you get too excited about this and then you just wanna go, 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 right? I'll do only one more, I promise, only one more. But you play with this yourself and you see what kind of weird things you can create. We're interested in studying the surfaces that are not got lots of bad places to them. It's kind of hard to reach inside there, but it looks like some kind of lumpy bread loaf in the middle there. And the purple thing is a smooth envelope on top. Then I've got smooth envelopes on the bottom, but inside there looks like a green lumpy bread loaf or something. I don't know how to describe it well. And notice it is expensive for Mathematica to rotate this because there's lots of data. When I say expensive, it means it's slow. Mathematica is taking time to recalculate this. Okay, this is good enough for today. I just am introducing you to the universe of surfaces, right? And I want to make you warned that bad things can happen to surfaces, just like bad things happen to curves and calculus. So I want to know where the bad things are. I want to know how to avoid them, like we did with curves in space. And I want to know alternate descriptions for surfaces so that if one description like rectangular or cylindrical was not effective, I could try different parameterizations to give me different perspectives on the surfaces. Okay, that is all I wanted to accomplish today. Bringing your words from calculus to surfaces, calculus of curves to calculus of surfaces, and showing you some pretty examples. Why don't you experiment with Mathematica and see what interesting services you can construct? I'm gonna stop the sharing. I'm going to stop the video and uh, load these notes and video later this morning. And I will see you next time.